The Battle of Amiens, also known as the Third Battle of Picardy, which began on 8 August 1918, was the opening phase of the Allied offensive later known as the Hundred Days Offensive that ultimately led to the end of the First World War. Allied forces advanced over 11 kilometers on the first day, one of the greatest advances of the war, with Henry Rawlinson's British Fourth Army playing the decisive role. The battle is also notable for its effects on both sides' morale and the large number of surrendering German forces. This led Erich Ludendorff to describe the first day of the battle as the Black Day of the German Army. Amiens was one of the first major battles involving armoured warfare and marked the end of trench warfare on the Western Front, fighting becoming mobile once again until the armistice was signed on of November 1918. Prelude. On 21 March 1918, the German Empire had launched Operation Michael, the first in a series of attacks planned to drive the Allies back along the length of the Western Front. With the signing of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk with revolutionary-controlled Russia, the Germans were able to transfer hundreds of thousands of men to the Western Front, giving them a significant, if temporary, advantage in manpower and material. These offensives were intended to translate this advantage into victory. Operation Michael was intended to defeat the right wing of the British Expeditionary Force, but a lack of success before Arras ensured the ultimate failure of the offensive. A final effort was aimed at the town of Amiens, a vital railway junction but the advance had been halted at villers bretonneux by British and Australian troops on 4 April. Subsequent German offensives, Operation Georgette, Operation Blue Cajork, Operation Eisenau and Operation Marne Rims, all made advances elsewhere on the Western Front, but failed to achieve a decisive breakthrough. By the end of the Marne Rims offensive, the German manpower advantage had been spent and their supplies and troops were exhausted. The Allied Generalissimo, General Ferdinand Foch, ordered a counter-offensive which led to the Second Battle of the Marne, after which victory he was promoted to Marshal of France. The Germans, recognizing their untenable position, withdrew from the Marne to the north. Foch now tried to move the Allies back onto the offensive. Plan Foch disclosed his plan on 23 July 1918, following the Franco-American victory at the Battle of Soissons. The plan called for reducing the St. Mihail salient and freeing the railway lines that ran through Amiens from German shellfire. The commander of the British Expeditionary Force, Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig, already had plans in place for an attack near Amiens. When the British retreat had ended in April, the headquarters of the British Fourth Army under General Sir Henry Rawlinson had taken over the front astride the Somme. Its left-hand corps was the British Third Corps under Lieutenant General Richard Butler, while the Australian Corps under John Monash held the right flank and linked up with French armies to the south. On 30 May, all the Australian infantry divisions were united under the Corps HQ, for the first time on the Western Front. The Australians had mounted a number of local counter-attacks which both revealed the suitability of the open and firm terrain south of the Somme for a larger offensive and also established and refined the methods which were to be used. Rawlinson had submitted Monash's proposals to Haig in July and Haig had forwarded them to Foch. At a meeting on 24 July, Foch agreed to the plan but insisted that the French First Army, which held the front to the south of the British Fourth Army, should participate. Rawlinson opposed this as his and Monash's plans depended on the large-scale use of tanks to achieve surprise, by avoiding a preliminary bombardment. The French First Army lacked tanks and would be forced to bombard the German positions before the infantry advance began, thus removing the element of surprise. Eventually, it was agreed that the French would participate but not launch their attack until 45 minutes after the Fourth Army. It was also agreed to advance the proposed date of the attack from 10 August to 8 August to strike the Germans before they had completed their withdrawal from the Marne salient. 
Rawlinson had already finalized his plans in discussion with his core commanders on 21 July. For the first time, the Australians would attack side by side with the Canadian Corps. Both had a reputation for aggressive and innovative tactics and a strong record of success over the past two years. The tactical methods had been tested by the Australians in a local counter-attack at the Battle of Hamel on 4 July. The German defenders of Hamel were deeply dug in, and the position commanded a very wide field of fire. Similar positions had resisted capture for two months in the Battle of the Somme. The Australians had used surprise rather than wait at Hamel. The artillery had opened fire only at the moment the infantry and tanks advanced, and the Germans were rapidly overrun. A key factor in the final plan was secrecy. There was to be no pre-battle bombardment, only artillery fire immediately prior to the advance of Australian, Canadian and British forces. The final plan for the 4th Army involved 1,386 field guns and howitzers and 684 heavy guns, making up 27 medium artillery brigades and 13 heavy batteries, in addition to the infantry division's artillery. The fire plan for the 4th Army's artillery was devised by Monash's senior artillery officer, Major General C.E.D. Budworth. British sound ranging advances in artillery techniques and aerial photographic reconnaissance made it possible to dispense with ranging shots to ensure accurate fire. Budworth had produced a timetable which allowed 504 out of 530 German guns to be hit at zero hour, while a creeping barrage preceded the infantry. This method was similar to the foyer walls or which the Germans themselves had used in their spring offensive, but its effectiveness was increased by the surprise achieved. There were also to be 580 tanks. The Canadian and Australian Corps were each allocated a brigade of four battalions, with 108 Mark V fighting tanks, 36 Mark V star, and 24 unarmed tanks intended to carry supplies and ammunition forward. A single battalion of Mark V tanks was allocated to 3rd Corps. The Cavalry Corps were allocated two battalions each of 48 medium Mark A Whippet tanks. The Allies had successfully moved the Canadian Corps of four infantry divisions to Amiens without them being detected by the Germans. This was a noteworthy achievement and reflected well on the increasingly efficient staff work of the British armies. A detachment from the Corps of two infantry battalions, a wireless unit and a casualty clearing station had been sent to the front near Ypres to bluff the Germans that the entire corps was moving north to Flanders. The Canadian corps was not fully in position until 7 August. To maintain secrecy, the Allied commanders pasted the notice, keep your mouth shut, into orders issued to the men, and referred to the action as if raid, rather than in offensive. Preliminaries Although the Germans were still on the offensive in late July 1918, the Allied armies were growing in strength, as more American units arrived in France and British reinforcements were transferred from the Home Army in Britain and the Sinai and Palestine campaign. The German commanders realized in early August that their forces might be forced onto the defensive, though Amiens was not considered to be a likely front. The Germans believed the French would probably attack the saint mihiel front east of Reims or in Flanders near Mount Kemmel, while they believed the British would attack along either the Lys or near Albit. The Allies had indeed mounted a number of local counter-offensives in these sectors, both to gain local objectives to improve their defensive positions and to distract attention from the Amiens sector. German forces began to withdraw from the Lys and other fronts in response to these theories. The Allies maintained equal artillery and air fire along their various fronts, moving troops only at night and feigning movements during the day to mask their actual intent. 
The German front east of Amiens was held by their 2nd Army under General Georg von der Marwitz, with six divisions in line. There were only two divisions in immediate reserve. There was some concern among the Allies on 6 August when the German 27th Division actually attacked north of the Somme on part of the front on which the Allies planned to attack two days later. The German division penetrated roughly 800 yards into the one-and-a-half-mile front. This attack was made in retaliation for a trench raid by the 5th Australian Division north of the Somme on the night of 31 July, which had gained many prisoners before the Australian Corps was concentrated south of the river. The German division moved somewhat back to its original position on the morning of 7 August. But the movement still required changes to the Allied plan. Battle The battle began in dense fog at 4.20 a.m. on 8 August 1918. Under Rawlinson's 4th Army, the British 3rd Corps attacked north of the Somme, the Australian Corps to the south of the river in the centre of 4th Army's front, and the Canadian Corps to the south of the Australians. The French 1st Army under General Debeney opened its preliminary bombardment at the same time, and began its advance 45 minutes later, supported by a battalion of 72 Whippet tanks. Although German forces were on the alert, this was largely in anticipation of possible retaliation for their incursion on the 6th and not because they had learned of the pre-planned Allied attack. Although the two forces were within 460 metres of one another, gas bombardment was very low. As the bulk of the Allied presence was unknown to the Germans, the attack was so unexpected that German forces only began to return fire after five minutes, and even then at the positions where the Allied forces had assembled at the start of the battle and had long since left. In the first phase, seven divisions attacked the British 18th and 58th, the Australian 2nd and 3rd, and the Canadian 1st, 2nd and 3rd Divisions. Parts of the American 33rd Division supported the British attackers north of the Somme. The attackers captured the first German position, advancing about 3.7 kilometres by about 7.30 a.m. In the centre, supporting units following the leading divisions attacked the second objective a further 3.2 kilometres distant. Australian units reached their first objectives by 7.10 a.m. and by 8.20 a.m. The Australian 4th and 5th Divisions and the Canadian 4th Division passed through the initial breach in the German lines. The third phase of the attack was assigned to infantry carrying Mark V asterisk tanks. However, the infantry was able to carry out this final step unaided. The Allies penetrated well to the rear of the German defences and cavalry now continued the advance. One brigade in the Australian sector and two cavalry divisions in the Canadian sector. RAF and armoured car fire kept the retreating Germans from rallying. The Canadian and Australian forces in the centre advanced quickly, pushing the line 4.8 kilometres forward from its starting point by 11 a.m. The speed of their advance was such that a party of German officers and some divisional staff were captured while eating breakfast. A gap 24 kilometres long was punched in the German line south of the Somme by the end of the day. There was less success north of the river, where the British Third Corps had only a single tank battalion in support. The terrain was rougher and the German incursion of 6 August had disrupted some of the preparations. Although the attackers gained their first objectives, they were held up short of the Chapilly Spur, a steep wooded ridge. The British Fourth Army took 13,000 prisoners while the French captured a further 3,000. Total German losses were estimated to be 30,000 on 8 August. The 4th Army's casualties, British, Australian and Canadian infantry, were approximately 8,800, exclusive of tank and air losses and those of their French allies. German Army Chief of Staff Paul von Hindenburg noted the Allies' use of surprise and that Allied destruction of German lines of communication had hampered potential German counter-attacks by isolating command positions. The German general Erich Ludendorff described the first day of Amiens as the Schwarzer Tag des Deutschen. Here is 
not because of the ground lost to the advancing Allies, but because the morale of the German troops had sunk to the point where large numbers of troops began to capitulate. He recounted instances of retreating troops shouting, you're prolonging the war, at officers who tried to rally them, and blackleg, at reserves moving up. Five German divisions had effectively been engulfed. Allied forces pushed, on average, 11 kilometers into enemy territory by the end of the day. The Canadians gained 13 kilometers, Australians 11 kilometers, British 3.2 kilometers, and the French 8 kilometers. Later fighting the advance continued on the 9th of August, though not with the same spectacular results of the first day. The battle was widened on the north and the south of the initial attack called Battle of Montdidier. The infantry had outrun the supporting artillery and the initial force of more than 500 tanks that played a large role in the Allied success was reduced to six tanks fit for battle within four days. The Germans on Chapilly Spur commanded a wide field of fire to the south of the Somme, and the flanking fire held up the left units of the Australian Corps until late on 9 August. When a small Australian party slipped across the river and captured the village of Chapilly itself, together with a renewed attack by 3rd Corps, on the Canadian front, congested roads and communication problems prevented the British 32nd Division being pushed forward rapidly enough to maintain the momentum of the advance. On 10 August, there were signs that the Germans were pulling out of the salient from Operation Michael. According to official reports, the Allies had captured nearly 50,000 prisoners and 500 guns by 27 August. Even with the lessened armor the British drove 19 kilometers into German positions by 13 August. Field Marshal Haig refused the request of Marshal Falk to continue the offensive, preferring instead to launch a fresh offensive by Byme's 3rd Army between the Ankara and Scarpa. Aftermath The Battle of Amiens was a major turning point in the tempo of the war. The Germans had started the war with the Schlieffen Plan before the race to the sea slowed movement on the Western Front and the war devolved into trench warfare. The German spring offensive earlier that year had once again given Germany the offensive edge on the Western Front. Armoured support helped the Allies tear a hole through trench lines, weakening once impregnable trench positions. The British Third Army with no armoured support had almost no effect on the line while the 4th, with fewer than a thousand tanks, broke deep into German territory. Australian commander John Monash was knighted by King George V in the days following the battle. British war correspondent Philip Gibbs noted Amiens' effect on the war's tempo, saying on 27 August that, the enemy, is on the defensive, and, the initiative of attack is so completely in our hands that we are able to strike him at many different places. Gibbs also credits Amiens with her, shift in troop morale, saying, the change has been greater in the minds of men than in the taking of territory. On our side the army seems to be buoyed up with the enormous hope of getting on with this business quickly, and that, there is a change also in the enemy's mind, they no longer have even a dim hope of victory on this western front.